has stopped tracking me, and so I just kind of make sure I stay here <laughs> for a while. I've, I literally have not had the time to come down here and spend half an hour or an hour working on that. So I just try to keep myself centered here. And let's see. Yes, we're recording. Okay. So the online class gets to watch me take attendance here. Hello, online class. John, Mark, Landon, Haley, Chris, Jimmy, Daniel, Matt, there's Matt, uh, Michael, Cody, and Noel, Fred, Corey, Jordan, I know about Austin's here. Did you get my? Did you get my note? And did it make sense? Yeah. So okay. Okay. Um. Depending on <laughs> if you're if you're a cruel person like my wife, you will tease me about this. If you're kind people, you will. <laughs> One of the things over spring break, the, in building this lab up, we literally tore everything out that was here before and started from a blank sheet of paper. That's why we're having kind of the growing pains we are on that lab. And one of the things I learned is when I write something down, I really ought to refer to it before I start patching cables because I'd ended up, when I did the cabling over spring break, I ended up with my lab station three patched into lab station four's stuff and vice versa, which meant we couldn't let you do the labs. <laughs> we found it yesterday and I didn't want to rush developing them, testing out the lab and developing it. So basically what I'm going to do is go ahead and cover the last section of material in this section that we're talking about. Um, and then we'll do we'll do the lab. The lab I had for today is actually fairly short. So basically you'll do it as homework next week. We'll talk about it and then we'll go on with the one we're planning. Uh, one other thing, I had inadvertently kept Module 3 named the way it used to be in this class, and so I went back both in Canvas and on these slides and named it. The content's the same. I haven't changed any of that. I just changed the name of the module to signaling. That's what I'd intended it to be. Yeah, it is. So, so what we're going to talk about today, we have been looking at... SIP and SIP signaling and voice over IP and all of that from a packet world. Earlier we had compared packet networking and circuit switch networking. Of course, those are two very different, ooh, it's hot in there, very different ways of accomplishing the same thing. You guys are used to packet. And to a certain extent, when we talk about PST and protocols, you sort of have to unlearn or undevelop, if you will. <laughs> The PSTN protocols ultimately are going to go away. PSTN, as we discussed, is a circuit switch network. It fundamentally works differently. In the packet network, you, if you look at a bandwidth view of packet, packet allocates all of the network to an application for the duration of time it takes to transmit a single packet. So if I have 100 applications sharing bandwidth, each one of them gets the entire network, but only for the length of time that it gets it. And when I say network, I mean the local network, because, I, of course, you know well from your classes, each packet contains enough addressing information that it can independently find its way through the network and get to its destination. Now, odds are most of the packets in a, in a transaction, in a call, are going to take the same path, but they don't have to. It's possible, unlikely, but possible that every packet will take a different path. In circuit switching, that doesn't happen. And we're going to look kind of a little more under the hood in that. In circuit switching, I actually build the complete path for the application. In our case, it's a call. And I leave that path in place for the use of that one call for the duration of the call. It doesn't matter if I'm using it or not. That bandwidth is allocated. That's just a fundamentally different way of looking at things. 
from an addressing point of view, if I have a dedicated path, apparently, from me to you, why do I need to address anything? I don't. Once I set that path up, I don't have to send any address information. It's already there. The addressing information has already done its job. So all I have to send you is application data. And that's a very different way of looking at the world. Okay. So signaling protocols that work in a packet world work one way. And when we change the way that bandwidth's allocated, the signaling protocols look different. So what we're going to look at today is PST and signaling. Here's the graphic that basically goes with it. You've already seen this. I'm not real worried about pulling it up. Circuit switch network, I'm going to build this path. It might be between two local phones with one switch in the middle. It might have half a dozen switches in the middle. It doesn't matter. You don't know as the user. And if you weren't a major in this area, you probably wouldn't care. Most users don't. But what, where'd my path go? <laughs> oh, I see. We broke it. What we do is build a path all the way through. One of those upper level paths goes away. We break the communication. Whereas in a packet network, provided I build redundant paths between routers, I have more than one path to the world leaving a router, then I can break an awful lot of paths and still be able to move traffic from end to end. And that really comes down to the fundamental reason we were choosing between this. Packet switching actually came out of a military requirement for secure, for uh, I've lost my term I'm looking for, <laughs> not secured, um, resilient networks. We wanted to build a network that could pass the traffic we needed to do, even if we blew up an awful lot of stuff in the network. Yes, literally. <laughs> so what we're going to do is take that, and we're going to look at what effect that has on us in terms of doing signaling. Now, you also have to remember the PSTN started being built recognizably in the late 1880s. That's, what, 130 years ago? A lot's changed. It was recognized, if there was stuff that Alexander Graham Bell would recognize in the core of the network in the late 1980s. There is stuff in the network right now that is used by enterprise customers that Bell would be perfectly comfortable with. So that's kind of the hard part in this class, is we're covering a huge range. Fortunately, our life's gotten somewhat easier in that for enterprise purposes, when we're talking about business installations, really the only analog we have are for small office environment trunks. We don't really use analog phones much anymore in the enterprise. You'll probably, you might run into some. I haven't recently. I'm sorry? Enterprise, enterprise, no, enterprise meaning the network support for an organization. It doesn't matter if that organization is three people or 10,000 or 100,000 people. We're talking about the overall enterprise. So what, what I mean when I say analog in the enterprise, if you look at State Farm Insurance, State Farm has the largest private network in the world. In fact, one of our graduates designs data centers for them and does all their wide area network stuff now. So it's a neat place to visit and look. It's just a little far away to take classes. State Farm, in spite of all that, the model of State Farm's network occupies three floors of a building, and it is just row after row after row of racks. That's the model of their network <laughs> that they use. They still use analog. Why? Because every one of those agents' office that they have out in the world, when you go in, they have the same network gear in there. There'll be some form of a Cisco router or a Cisco shop. It'll have the local network that you've all worked on, all that stuff, you know, so it does DHCP and DNS and all the things we need to do. They'll have IP phones. And if you make a call to State Farm, it's going to run across that IP network. What's hard for State Farm to do affordably is to centralize all P 
PSTN connections. They do centralize long distance. But to let the state farm insurance here in Murray call me at my house in Murray, it really doesn't make sense to backhaul that all the way up to Indiana, put it on their long distance carrier and bring it back down here. We've just taken a local call and turned it into a long distance call. Oh, by the way, what happens if, not when, if, well, I'm sorry, other way around, not if, when that data network connection from the remote office breaks. It may not happen often, but it's going to happen. That agent needs to be able to make calls. And that's what the analog lines are for. They are lines to connect to the LEC so that you can make local calls without having to go all the way around the world, the world being Indiana, and to give you a backup way to make calls even if that network goes down. So that's kind of the shape of the world. In the days of analog telephone, signaling was accomplished using voltages and currents across the copper loop. Remember that what we have in here is a loop of wire between that phone and the switch in the middle. To make a call between me and you, I tell the switch that I want to talk to you. It connects our local loops together. We have one continuous loop of copper. I'm oversimplifying a little, not vastly. Fundamentally, that's what goes on. When all we were doing was voice, life was pretty simple. <laughs> you know, you had a phone on your desk, I have a phone on mine. Okay? I call you. There are only a few things that we really need to have happen. You need to know when I'm calling you, okay, so I need to make a bell ring on your desk or a light or something like that, some way to let you know that there's a call coming in. We need some way to move audio. From a signaling point of view, the switch needs to know whether your phone is available for a call or not when I send a request to that switch, and I'm purposely using some vague language, send a request to that switch to talk to you. If you're already on the phone in the simple days of the 1880s and 90s, I'm not going to send a call to you. Okay? Even nowadays, that's mostly the common way of doing things. You know, if you're already on a call, I don't want to interrupt it. So we have to be able to recognize what the state of that in terminal is. We also need to be able to differentiate within those states. On hook is a specific meaning. Let's, we went over these very early in the semester, but let's review them. If a phone is sitting down, you're not trying to make a call, you're not dialing, you're not in a call, it's just waiting for a call, that's called on hook. From a signaling point of view, what has happened is that copper loop is open. There is no current flowing in it. Okay. When you decide to make a call, you pick up the phone. Mechanically what that does is close that loop and causes current to flow in that loop of wire. The switch detects that current flow and that's how it knows you've gone off hook. Now, from the switch's point of view, switches aren't real bright devices. They do what they do pretty well, but they're not real bright. If you're a switch and you're watching my line and all of a sudden it goes from on hook to off hook, what do you assume I'm doing? You didn't send me a call. I just changed from on hook to off hook. So what, what's get, what as a switch do I assume is getting ready to happen? I'm going to make a call. So basically, you're going to expect digits. There's more that goes on nowadays, you know, very pretty early on, people would, the Bell Company realized that when people picked up the phone, if they didn't hear something, they would think it was broken. And so they set dial tone. So you pick up the phone, the switch detects that you've gone off hook and sends dial tone you as a signal to you to dial digits. In heavily loaded systems, it actually would say wait, in a sense, because it could take a second or two for dial tone to get to you, and you didn't dial until it did. That's pretty rare. That was pretty rare even by the end. 
So anyway, I go off hook. My state changes from no current to current flowing. You, the switch, send me dial tone. I dial digits or later hit buttons that send tones to tell you what number I want to dial. I'm providing you addressing information. You make a connection. All of that is going on in the off hook status for my side. I give it the address of your phone, and it looks at your line first. It, the switch, looks at your line to see if you're available for a call. If you're busy, it's just going to send me a busy signal. No, you can't do this now. Hang up. How would it know if I hung up? What do I physically do? Put the receiver down, which does what? Opens the loop and I stop drawing current. So I go back to an on hook mode. Okay. Assuming you're off the line, the switch sees you're off the line. I've got to let you know there's a call. So the switch is going to sing, send a ringing voltage sound. It's going to make the bell on your phone ring. I'm not going to go into the deep electrical part of how it works. Basically, it's going to send a signal to let you know there's a call for you. When you pick up the phone, what happens on your local loop? When your handset's on the base, is your loop drawing current? No. So when you pick up the phone, what does the switch see? Current gets drawn. Okay. Again, from a switch's point of view, not real bright. That means you've picked up the phone. I can eye the switch. It's okay. I'm not real bright. We can remove ring voltage, and then I'm going to send audio through to your phone. Okay. So in that case, both of those lines are then in a state we call busy. They're in a call. They're actively exchanging audio. I'm not actively sending signaling or expecting signaling from them. When we're ready to end the call, one of us hangs up, which does what? I hang up. I'm on this side. What happens at the switch end? It doesn't close the loop. It opens the loop. On my, when I hang the phone up, it opens the loop. So what, happened, what does the switch see? I stopped drawing current. You must have hung up the phone, so the switch is going to tear down everything else. Okay. There's some ins and outs to it that we're not going to go into. What I just described is something called loop start signaling. There are actually about 18 variations. I didn't pull that number out of the air. There actually are about 18 variations on analog signaling. There are more more than loop start is being used for where our people normally get hired, you're not going to see it. If you do, call me. I'll give you some stuff, some reading material. So loop start signaling basically uses that absence or presence of current to convey information about the status of that phone. Okay. So let's review. On hook, I'm waiting for a call. Off hook specifically means I'm trying to make a call. Okay. Ringing is the switch is trying to deliver a call to me, but I still haven't picked up the phone. And busy means we're both off hook. We both have picked up the receivers, and audio is being passed between us. Okay. Four states. Okay. Pretty simple. Hold that thought. Throughout most of the PSTN history, we used analog transmission. Now, in the very early days, the entire path was a single copper, copper wire pair. You know, I had one wire pair. That can, yes? Uh, can the switch tear down the entire connection if one side's still off the hook? Hold that thought. You've, you've anticipated about five slides up. <laughs> the answer is no, it cascades. First switch signals. You mean if you're connected to multiple switches? I mean, like if, if you're having a phone call and one person sets it down without hanging it up, is the connection still there? Depends on the exact variant of the signaling. In basic loop start signaling, the, per the 
that the call that made that initiated the call actually controls the signaling. And so there, there was an old trick, as a matter of fact, where I could call you, you would answer the phone, we'd talk, you'd hang up, and I'd set my phone down. I wouldn't hang it up. I'd just set it down. So I'm still drawing current, and your call would not be torn down. So your phone would show busy until I hung up. There was a story about a business in New York that used that to his advantage. Guy would call his competitor across town. Guy would answer. He'd just set the phone down. Well, somebody calls you and you don't hear anything. What are you going to do? Hang up. <laughs> okay. So the guy would hang up. His competitor just left his phone off the hook. So the guy's phone never rang. Now, there are, there, there's something called forward disconnect supervision that handles that. We're not going to go that deep into loop start signaling. Um, if you have multiple switches in line, the signaling is passed from one switch to the next, and that causes a problem we're going to look at here in a minute. For most of the history of the PSTN, we've used a single wire pair as a trunk. Now, we may bundle a bunch of these into a big cable. If you remember that cabling diagram we looked at, we talked about 600 pair cables and 30 pair cables and all that stuff. Mechanically, what we're doing, though, is creating one loop. I am skipping an entire few decades worth of technology. There actually was something called analog multiplexing. It's very interesting in a historical, painful sort of way. If you want to see, I have a nice thick book that I can loan you on it. It's actually pretty inventive to see. I'm ignoring all of that. I'm jumping directly from about 1920 to about 1960, okay, and I realize that. If I were building the network in those wire days, the more connections, the more traffic that I had traveling between two switches, the more wire pairs I had to have between those switches. Okay? A couple of problems. First off, wire's expensive. It's copper. You have to physically install it. It's the most expensive thing you have to do, arguably, in building a telephone network. Second, in New York, which is where the first stab at this actually came from, a lot of the high-rise buildings, like the Chrysler Building and the Empire State Building, were, had risers, pipes from the basement up, designed when a business might have one or two phones. You know, well, by the time we get to the 60s, that's no longer the case. You have every business has, you know, many phones, and they literally, physically ran out of space to run more cable. Same thing was happening in the under-the-street conduits. So we had the problem that we literally couldn't install more cable, both for economic reasons and for physical reasons. We needed to ha have some way to move more calls over the same amount of cable. Second thing, analog transmission inherently has two problems. We've talked about them. What were they? Signal strength degrades over the length. I put a nice fresh signal in one end of a wire, and because, just because of physical laws, part of the energy in that signal is used to heat up that wire. We recognize that as something called attenuation. Basically, the volume of that analog signal drops as it travels along a wire pair. Sooner or later, enough of that signal has decayed that it can't, it doesn't have the power to rise above the noise level, and I can't distinguish it from noise. So it's, at that point, it becomes useless. You can do things like amplify, things like that, but you still get into problems. If you'll remember, we looked at something called signal-to-noise ratio, and we noted that as we amplified at each step, we were actually amplifying what was left of the signal plus all the noise that it picked up along the line, which is the other half of this problem. And after you did that a few times, your signal to the ratio of desired signal to noise had degraded pretty badly. I'm 54. I'm old enough to remember when long distance calls were noticeably noisier. You could actually kind of gauge about how far somebody was. Both of those problems are inherent to the physics of how this system works. You can't get rid of them using analog techniques.
If we were building the network now, we'd put DSPs on the end of this and we could add out a lot of it. Well, we're not building the network now. We found a better way to do things. <laughs> to get around these two problems, in the late 50s, and it was actually implemented in the 60s, we switched to digital transmission. Now understand, Bell at the time was the phone company. There were some independent local companies, but Bell was the major company that was a legal monopoly in this country. Now, I'm not commenting on whether that was right or wrong. There were good reasons and bad reasons for it being done. I'll leave that to policy people. The upshot of it was that we had a very highly vertically integrated network. So technological advancement was done centrally. Bell Labs developed most of the technology that we use now. It's only in the last few years that a lot of that development has gone somewhere else. Bell Labs became Lucent in uh, 1984 and took them about 15 years to self-destruct. What they decided to do was to address the problem of attenuation and noise by using digital transmission. If you'll remember, we looked at that. We code a signal. And we'll look at this again when we look at transmission. But when we code the signal, basically what happens is that induced noise simply never gets decoded. Now, we can induce enough noise that I lose the signal, but that in a well-engineered network isn't going to happen, or at least not often. So what we do is set up a world where it doesn't really matter how much noise I pick up. I'm going to generate a new, clean signal, and there's no noise buildup. So that deals with the noise and attenuation problem. The other thing it lets us do, and the reason we, Bell actually looked at digital transmission was not as a data system. They had no intention of this being used for what we, we recognize as a data application. Their goal was to move the human voice more efficiently. Okay. The way we do this, of course, is code audio. So I have my analog on one end. I put it into a device called a codec, short for coder decoder. We take a sample. We send that across the link. The links, actually, I got ahead of myself. The links on that are run at 64 kilobits. 8-bit samples, 8,000 of them a second. We'll go through the math later. The important thing, we take that 8 bits from a single phone call. So I look at that input waveform. I sample it. I generate an 8-bit signal. And here's the key part. I send that 8 bits serially across the link. I don't keep 8 data leads up there. I keep one a path that is 1 bit wide, and I send the bits serially. Why is that important? Because it allows us to do something that I'll show you on the next page. At the other end, the, the codec on the other end takes the digital sample and recreates a facsimile of the original analog waveform. Okay. Here's a couple of important things to recognize about this. In this transmission system, there is no packet. There is no framing. It's just a stream of 8-bit samples, one after the other. There is nothing to separate the samples. It just starts running. Which means there's no signaling. So we've got a problem. I've solved my attenuation my noise problem. That's great. Now I can't tell you what the status is of the other end. So we've got a problem. If this were all we were doing, it would be an issue, but it's not. This was a stepping stone towards solving the other part of the problem, which was we need to do, move more calls over less cable. To do that, we insert a device called a multiplexer. You guys have seen this scheme. Let me give it to you in the terms of what happened in the PSTN. I would take an eight, I'd put a bunch of codecs together. Remember, they're taking analog audio and making 8-bit samples. What the multiplexer does is take an 8-bit sample from each of its input codecs in turn and just stacks them up. It sends them across the line. Now, multiplexer does add framing. It adds a little bit of overhead to this. The lowest level of this scheme is called T1. It has 24 voice channels. We add a little bit to it for framing and 
several things. We're going to dig into T1 more later. Right now, I'm worried about the signaling part. Basically, what we do here is we use some, band, some of the bandwidth to represent signaling. Now, notice what's happening here. This is a digital system. But how am I sharing bandwidth? I'm not doing the packet method. Remember, packet, each user got the entire network, but only for part of the time. If I had a packet to send, I got to use all of the network bandwidth, but only for the length of time it takes me to send one packet. In this scheme, I'm allocating 64 kilobits between pairs of endpoints. So I am linking the first codec on that end with the first codec on that end. And that connection is dedicated. Only those two codecs can use that. So even though this is digital, I'm still doing circuit switching. So if I assign a particular call to the top codec, it's going to use part of that bandwidth, 1 24th of it actually, all the time. So I'm giving you part of the network all of the time instead of all of the network part of the time. You okay with that? It's simple, but it's different from what you've seen. Is why I kind of beat on that one pretty hard. Okay. We'll dig into how T1 works specifically a little more. If you've looked at T1, you'll notice that the last two digits of the data rate are actually off by 8 kilobits. I'm well aware of that. I'll explain it later. Short version is, we can't, since this is a digital carrier, I can play some games and do my signaling. If I have four states, four unique states that I need to represent, how many bits do I need? How many values can a single bit have? Two, zero or one. So if I want to represent four unique states, how many bits do I have to have? Two, right, because with two bits, I can represent four combinations. That's what we do. On hook, and I just made up the combinations here. On hook, we might call zero, zero. Set those two bits. Each of those bits is set to zero. Off hook, zero, one. Ringing, one, zero. Busy, one, one. Something along that line. Now I've solved all of my problems. I've dealt with attenuation. I've dealt with noise pickup. I can move, in this case, 24 calls across a lot less wire, and I can move the signaling from end to end. OK. Everything we've talked about so far, excuse me, has, shares a characteristic, and that is that the signaling and the audio travel in the, exactly the same path. Not just the same geographic path, they actually travel over the same bandwidth path. In an analog circuit, you know, you've got the wire pair that's carrying your audio and we're playing voltage and current games with it to do signaling. In a multiplex system, I'm taking part of the bandwidth out of that 64 kilobits that is a dedicated channel for one call, and I'm using it to represent my signaling. Okay. That's called channel associated signaling. That's a $5 term for it. You'll hear the term in band signaling. All it means is signaling and audio travel the same path. And there's a problem with it, we're going to look at it in a second. The other term you're going to hear is called common channel signaling, and this is this will be much more familiar to you. This is where we take all of the signaling and put it on a separate network. That's what you guys are used to seeing. Okay. It's a pretty recent development in terms of the PSTN. It didn't actually start being used until the late 70s. really wasn't implemented broadly until the 80s. And of course, if you look at SIP or H323 or any of the voice over IP applications, that's exactly how they work. Okay. Now, 
I know some of this is kind of a stroll down memory lane or <laughs> a stroll through memory nightmare. But here's, here's where we got in trouble with this. Remember what I said, that this whole thing was built to move the human voice. And it was built in that very highly vertically integrated structure. We looked at five levels of switch and this, that, and the other. There's a problem with doing channel-associated signaling. Let's say I'm going to call from Murray to Los Angeles. I pick up the phone, and I dial your number in Los Angeles. I'll let you live in L.A. this, morning, this afternoon. All of that stuff we talked about happens here. I pick up my phone. I close the circuit. I draw a current. The switch sees that I'm drawing current. It sends me dial tone. I get the digits, yada, 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 yada. My local switch in this world, think 60s, 70s, my local switch in this world would interpret those digits and send, probably up to the next level of the hierarchy, would send my call across a trunk. A trunk is another connection that uses channel-associated signaling. So think about what we're doing from the switch's point of view. This switch has received a call and is, in essence, making a call on my behalf to the next switch down the line. Okay? So it's going to do an analogous process to my going off hook and drawing current and all that. It's going to open a connection to the next switch. The next switch will see that that connection has opened, similar to the local switch seeing me go off hook. It will acknowledge that that connection's there, and then I'll, the first switch will send digits to the next switch. And we're going to repeat that process until we get to the switch that knows how to deliver a call to you on the other end. Okay? You okay with that? We're going to step the signaling across here. Now let me ask you this. What happens if I make, actually I've got me in L.A. That's you. What happens if you call me, you pick up the phone and dial, and we start this process. What happens if I'm on the phone? Okay. Where does the busy signal come from? Uh, probably the leg. Hmm? Which leg? Yeah. In this scheme... I had to put that entire path in place just so that my local switch knows that the other end isn't available. I'm selling the use of this network per minute for money, actually per second for money. This is not a good thing because under the law at the time, phone companies weren't allowed to bill for the time it took to set up a call. Only once both parties were on the line could they bill you. So in other words, I just spent, remember this is also in the time of manual dialing and manual signaling, it might take a second or two for each of these connections to go up. So I could pretty easily tie up 20, 30 seconds just to find out that you're on the phone. So I've just gotten a nice cheap trip to New York to listen to a New York busy signal. AT&T did a study on this in the 70s. And what they found was that of all of their network capacity that was used for voice, I'll put that caveat up front. They'd actually started doing some data stuff at this point. But of all their network capacity used for voice, take a shot at how much of that was non-billable. In other words, this situation that they couldn't bill anybody for the use of that network. <laughs> nice broad number. Your last number is actually closer. It's over half of their network time was unbillable. Now think about the size of the AT&T network and think about the amount of revenue when you're charging for the use of a network by the second or by the quarter minute or by the minute. That's an awful lot of revenue.
oh, by the way, <laughs> if I called and you weren't home, I heard your ring signal. Now, what I heard actually came across the network. We fixed that later. We, like I did it. <laughs> they fixed it later. But the problem in, in all of these cases is with channel-associated signaling, I had to build this entire path even if the call couldn't be delivered. You can guess what the, response, what the solution was. We actually built a separate network. This, by this time, microprocessing, this would be late 70s, 80s, processing power had gotten inexpensive. You know, we had microprocessors with enough capability that they could actually do useful work in this environment. And what you ended up with is that switching matrix on the switch was actually controlled by fairly inexpensive computers. And so we could do more complex methods to do switching, even if we weren't really changing what we're doing. What they did was built a separate network completely, and it was a packet network. And each of the switches along that path had a connection into this network, and they would exchange information about status of ports. So that same call, I call, I forget how I started this, I pick up the phone and call a number that's going to go through several switches to you. Instead of actually building that path, my local switch is going to query the signaling network and ask if your phone on the other end of this path is available. Can, it, can you take a call? You know, are you busy? I'm actually going to go further than that. If you are available, your, call, your phone is on hook, then I'm going to actually, let me get in here. If it's busy, we just hang it up. If it's busy, my local switch returns the busy signal to me. No more listening to busy signals across the country. If you're there, or at least your phone is on hook, your switch is going to report back and say, yes, it's here. And so my switch is going to say, okay, ring the phone. Your switch sends a ring voltage to your phone. My switch, my local switch in my town, sends that ring back tone. So I'm not listening to the ring from your switch anymore. I'm listening to the ring from my switch. If you pick up the phone, we build the path between the switches. It's actually a little more complex than that. Once, this, once we're in the situation where your phone's ringing, there's actually some reservation protocol and stuff that goes on. So if this answers, we can put a call up real quickly. We won't worry about that nicety. Basically, if you pick up the phone, we build the path end to end at that instant. I've not completely eliminated call setup time, but I've sure taken a cut out of it. Okay. The common channel signaling network, it actually went through several variations. The current version of it is called Signaling System 7, you know, those clever engineers and their inventive names. SS7 is alive and well. It's still around. The signaling protocol on it is something called Q931. Uh, extremely capable, very cryptic. If you look through it, it's kind of, unless you've had any training, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on with most of it, but it, it does a lot. And it was actually built looking at the world a little differently. Like I said, it's a separate network. It's a packet network. And one of the things about SS7 is at the time it was designed, the network, they knew the network was going to be digital end to end. The plan was actually for it to be digital all the way to the desktop. I'll come back to that thought in a minute. But all of the connection between switches was digital. Well, you can do one thing, you can do a lot of things with digital, but there's one thing in particular you can do that you can't do with analog very well, and that is move data, things that are pure data, not coded voice, but computer data, 
pictures, video, oh, websites. Okay. Now I put this in context for you because we're all used to really, really fast connections now. At the time this network was put together, most modems ran 2400 baud, which meant they could move bits about 9600 bits per second. Not kilobits, not megabits, 9600 bits. And that was fast. Okay. This system, remember, how, what was the voice channel? Anybody remember the number? 64 kilobits. It screams, relatively speaking. So with the digital network, I could do things like, yes, I can move my voice call across it because we designed it to move the human voice. But I can also do stuff like, instead of using my modem to get 9,600 bits, I can use equipment that's capable of using a digital carrier, and I can get 64,000 bits a second. Whoa. I mean, that's huge. I can bundle several channels together and get even faster rates. Okay? This was the scheme. Let me put it in a little more perspective. At this point, it was by no means certain that TCP IP was going to be the protocol of the world. There were about a dozen, eight to a dozen, depending on how you want to count exactly, protocols that were fighting out who was going to be the protocol. Spoiler alert, TCP IP won. But it was a different world at that point. Here's how Bell saw this. We were going to have things. We could do computer data calls. We could do voice calls. We could do video calls. You know, golly, you could, you know, grandma could look at the kids, all sorts of stuff like that. SS7 was built to support all of that. So it has an enormous amount of detail built into it. When we had, when I showed you the other day the packet capture for setting up a call in SIP, that's nothing compared to what it takes to set up a call in ISDN. It's literally about 400 lines to set to make the phone ring once. It's huge. The complexity came because they were trying to make, let's see, one digital network carry lots of different kinds of services: voice, data, video. Sound familiar? This is what we have now. It's just we didn't do it in the circuits, which were all we did it on Ethernet. Okay. And unfortunately, this grand scheme came apart. Now, we're still using pieces of it. SS7 is still alive and well. It is still the control protocol for the circuit switch public switch telephone network. Try saying that fast. The service they named on this is something called ISDN. It's called Integrated Services Digital Network. And it's probably the biggest marketing disaster that has ever happened. Technologically, it is wonderful. It was unbelievably forward thinking. The problem is the Bell Marketeers, are you old enough to remember this? ISDN coming in, or was it already here? What did you say the B stood for? Integrated Services Digital Network. Multiple services on a general purpose digital network is what they were planning. Bell Marketing sold this as the answer to everything. You know, milk was going to stop spoiling, world peace was going to rain down. You know, that's, that's kind of the way they put it. It could never live up to it. And the other thing that happened is cable TV really took off in this same time. Now, if you're from around this area, we've been kind of in a special circumstance with regard to cable TV. Murray got cable TV in 1962. Most of the towns in West Kentucky, because they're fairly far from most network outlets, you know, we had Channel 6, but ABC and CBS had to come from further away. Most of them had cable companies way before the rest of the country. Pennsylvania was the only other place that really had a lot of them. Well, in the 80s, the cable companies figured out that they could move data over this, and there was this, all these little services people were using on the Internet that people wanted. 
So they started switching over to digital. Well, what happened is that technology bypassed the circuit switch. And that's what we see now is we've got broadband data coming in. Here's how they were going to sell it. All the analog phones were going to be replaced with an ISDN phone. What they were going to deliver to your house was something called a basic rate interface. The only reason I'm even going through this history is because you will still see these terms when you buy service, if you buy digital circuit switch service, and, and there are still uses for that. We were going to deliver two of those 64 kilobit channels to your house along with, and those are called B channels, bearer channels, along with a D channel, which was this, that common channel signaling. So we're going to give you 128 kilobits of bandwidth Remember, this is in a time when everybody's modem, if you had a lot of money, was running at 9,600 bits. So this is screaming. And oh, by the way, you can make a data call at the same time you can make a voice call. All that kind of stuff. Companies or bigger users, we we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to do calls on a call-by-call -call digital basis. It's just we we're going to do more bearer channels. We we're going to put 23 bearer channels together along with a single D channel and call it a primary rate interface. You may see a BRI, maybe. They're still out there, still being sold. Not a lot. DSL's a lot cheaper, all that. You will see PRI. PRI is, is still used to develop, to deliver PSTN switched calls. It is the predominant way that PSTN switched calls are delivered if you need more than three trunks. We're going to look at, out of this whole slide presentation, there's two things we're going to dig into specifically in here in the lab. One of them is an analog um, loop start, as that term I was looking for, loop start circuit. Because if you are supporting small offices or failover, it's called network or survivability mode, you need to be able to do that. The other one is we're going to support this interface for getting circuit switch calls off the PSTN. Now, PSTN is circuit switch. It's using Q931 for signaling. We've got a network that uses SIP for signaling. Those two don't talk to each other. One's, talking, one's speaking Chinese, one's speaking Italian. They're just not going to communicate. So we're going to have to do some gateway functions between them. And that's why I go through this entire piece for you to see, is what you're going to have to do professionally is to be able to set up these gateway functions and be able to do the design part behind this. Okay? And with that, unless you have questions on this, I know it's a riveting subject, Circuit switch versus packet switch. You okay with that? Any questions on circuit switching? Key thing, circuit switching allocates data for the length of a call. The signaling reflects the way the network works, so packet switch network protocols just simply work differently than circuit switch. We've been looking at packet switch, the transaction base. Circuit switch can assume some things. Where we're going to go from this, I, we will have uh, a lab for you to look at SIP packets. That's what I'd actually intended to do in here today. Really what we've done is just switched what I intend to do today with what I intended to do next week. So we really haven't hurt things very much. You'll do a lab where you're going to look at SIP registration. You're going to look at that whole process we went through on the presentation the other day, and you're going to make some calls and see the SIP traffic between them. I particularly want you to pay attention to how you can keep track of what's going on in that call. Okay. The next piece we're going to do is to start, excuse me, we're going to move outside the confines of one box. We've, everything so far we've done has been on that one switch, and we're going to start using wide area net connections. The first ones we're going to do will be SIP. We'll connect to another SIP device. Let's see what you have to do to do that. Then we'll start picking up these other interfaces. Once we complete that, I'm going to move you into looking at some design stuff. 
Uh, part of this is how you put components together. Part of it is how much network do you need for your voice? How do you control network utilization? So that's where we're going between now and the end of the semester. Okay? You guys have a great weekend. Be safe. I'm sorry?